Well, Jim, I have a surprise for you. Made you a little something here. Oh, wow. <sighs> what do you think about that bad Whoa. boy, huh? Yep, I hey. made that for you. I bet this cost a uh, bunch of pretty pennies, yeah? It costs more than you'll ever know. What, what is that? Jim, let's tell you what. Let's have a conversation about homebrew magic item creation. Oh, sounds great. On WebDM. This episode is sponsored by Garage Quest. They make awesome shirts, uh, kind of like the ones we're wearing right now, but they also make pins and accessories too. Yeah, we're always on the lookout for new D&D shirts. These guys are new on the scene and they've got great non-text designs. The shirts are well made, they feel great, and uh, as you can see, they look cool too. Mm -hmm. And viewers can get 10% off all these shirts with the code WEBDM10. So go over there, check it out, and get you an awesome shirt. Uh, the link is below in the description and in the comments. All right, Jim. Uh, because as players, we're never happy with never. what we're given. Uh, let's talk about some homebrew magic items. Just uh, just how to how to make it yourself. How to how to get in there, mix up your stuff. You got to rub some stuff All together. together. Yeah, you yeah. got to say some words. Probably. You probably should. I mean, if Brunor can do it, and he's a fighter, right? <laughs> I mean, I realize it's a bygone edition. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. But, but still, you know. I mean, if he can do it, anybody can. Anybody can. I mean, at least if you have the magical capabilities. Oh, certainly, certainly, right. What's some things to consider uh, when, when you want to begin making magic items? First off, like homebrew magic items and cooking cooking them up and sort of making them work for your campaign is really satisfying. It, it's a part of the game that, that I often forget and sort of... Uh, Neglect the, the the fact that you know magic items are a part of this. They're they're part of the reward structure for mm -hmm. uh, for players. They're they're part of the in, inherent magic of the place. Uh, you know with the settings that you're playing in, your games and the like. So it, it's something that I, I I have to like actively remind myself. And then when I do, I'm just I'm like, well, I don't want to use any of the ones in the DMG necessarily, or, or maybe some of them. Mm -hmm. I want my own. I want my custom one. You know, I, I want ones that reflect my setting and, and the, how it's been played and, and you sort of like, you know, see the items as, as reflective of an in-game material culture and that they're from a place and, and someone in, in the history of this uh, world created them. Maybe they're tied to like player backgrounds or, or player cultures or something. They're, they're significant in that respect. I like the idea of them. I like the potential that they have for both world building and, and to give the players new options uh, to mm -hmm. interact with the game. They're just things that I usually forget about in the rush to describe a setting and come up with stuff for, um, you know, for players to, uh, to get hooked with. So, you know, considering their impact of the item on your game. From a from a mechanical point of view, what are you trying to do with this item? How big of an impact do you want it to have? Is this going to be like a centerpiece, a character defining item that is, um, you know, that you're creating custom because it ties into the story that you've got going on, the different plots of the game, or an NPC or something? Um, that's one thing to consider, and, yeah. and you know, it's one of those where it's like if you've got one that we've got like hype built up <laughs> around it. You know, it's the you know magical MacGuffin of whatever, and then once someone gets their hands on it, it's you know underwhelming or doesn't do what they thought it did or something. Like that can lead to a bit of dissonance, but uh, the opposite mm -hmm. can certainly occur too, where you create something that's too powerful uh, or too uh, just like throws the game off in ways that you're not uh, really expecting. And the other thing to consider is um, the place of the item in your setting. In we kind of touched on this a minute ago, but it's like, think about it for a minute. Is this a relic from a long lost civilization? And, and therefore, maybe people don't really know what it does or, or what it is, and so it'll be a surprise when it resurfaces. Is the item claimed by some group or, or faction or something in your setting? And it's like, oh, you found that. Well, you know, this is ours by rights. You know, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> these sorts of, you know, staves of power weren't just made by anybody. They've always been made by our guild. You know, we have the proprietary rights to it. Uh, and so <laughs> you can kind of think of it that way. Are, are there competing groups that would be interested in this item's discovery? Are there groups that would be, you know, would desire the item because uh, of the power it represents or because it has some kind of significance to them? And that's a way to make sure that the items you introduce into your game, uh, and particularly ones you're building yourself, are like enmeshed in the game world mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and like have a place in it. 
Oh yeah, well definitely if you're if you're adding that uh, that cultural legacy uh, to items. I mean, you see even in our own world, uh, you know, say, just look at, like, say, British whatever museum. Oh, sure, sure. And always enmeshed in some version of, mm -hmm. like, hey, these people kind of want their stuff back <laughs> that y'all took, like, a thousand years ago. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, like, when you translate that to, like, magic items, now yeah. you have a, a very different world where would you want to go out brandishing that, that blade that was only made yeah. in that one country yeah. where they have... Uh, you know, they have their archaeologist militia that goes out to reclaim everything that was taken from them in the great culling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and, and if you're thinking about it from just like those pure uh, world building perspective, you know, the, the default for a lot of D&D &D games is that you are going into places that are no longer inhabited. They were yeah. once inhabited. Yeah, they're ancient. <laughs> they're ancient. They're ruined or whatever, you know, but... It's tombs, and you're you know you're raiding the grave goods from you know from tombs, or you are um, you know visiting abandoned uh, strongholds and, and settlements and the like, and taking the durable goods that are left over there. So there's always been a bit of that good that old fashioned spirit imperialism, of, right? You're gonna just go take your stuff. Nothing you can do about. It. And so like it, you will want to think about those things because they can either add uh, you know rich complications for your game and and can uh, really drive forward sort of subquests and, and things like that but it can also be a big hassle because it goes against the expectations of the place of magic items as a reward structure in D&D &D. so mm -hmm. there's players who might see that item as like hey this is my reward for playing the game like why do we why are we <laughs> why is there all this hassle attached to it you know so it, it's that's what I mean when it's like saying worth considering um, how yeah. all these things fit together in addition to just like building the item itself and making something that's fun and interesting to play with, so. Well, I mean, yeah, especially you know, um, uh, if your players want to want to homebrew it themselves and build it themselves. Sure. I mean, you can build a whole whole adventures out of just gathering ingredients. Oh, know? certainly, right, right, right. Yeah, and so there's there's a few guidelines that are in uh, the official books for how to handle this and. Uh, the DMG Chapter 9 has uh, guidelines for just like creating a new item. Mm -hmm. It starts with sort of like tips for if you need to change or modify an item, you know, what what can be substituted for what. Uh, and so for the, uh, you know, for the authors of the DMG, it's a, uh, you know, if something's a ring, it can be a wand. If something is a, you know, sword, it can become an axe. So like changing the type of item, uh, you know, that it is is, Perfectly reasonable, no problem. Doesn't change anything about the rarity of it, for instance. Also, changing sort of the properties of an item, uh, you know, does it do a certain type of damage and changing that to a different type of damage? Or if it gives you, say, a bonus to one skill proficiency, maybe, you know, you just change the skill proficiency that it gives you a bonus to or something. Mm -hmm. So, an example of that might be like, yeah, I've got an elven cloak that gives me a bonus to my dexterity stealth checks. But, you know, maybe we take this and change it into a belt and we call it, you know, an orcish grappler's belt. And it's now, you know, gives you a bonus to, you know, athletic strength checks or something like that. Yeah. And, and it, it's in that sense that you're just sort of like taking the magic items that are in the DMG and using them as templates for your own and recognizing that these are just game effects. And you can change any one of these mm -hmm. to create a different sort of item uh, that you're... Uh, you know, that you can then integrate in your campaign world. After that, the only other thing it really recommends is combining two uh, items to get a different effect. And it seems to imply that, um, you know, you, you want to combine like items, helms and helms, weapons and weapons, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Like, go nuts. You can't <laughs> put a ring on your sword? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you're putting the effects of the ring on your sword and, and work it out, right? Like, is, if it's a, a ring that provides a continual benefit, then maybe it only provides that benefit when you're, you know, you have the weapon drawn oh, uh, oh, or oh, something like oh, that. Yeah. Dude, I can see a mariner's blade with a ring of water walking on it, so you draw your sword uh -huh. and run across the sea to, the, to board the next ship. You know? Right, right, right. Oh, yeah, that'd be a really good one. Just to, I mean, but you get your sword knocked out of your hand. Yeah, yeah. Or sucks. you need to swim. You right. sheathe your sword and, and then yeah. get. Yeah, yeah. So I think I like that because then you can have you know maybe that particular type of weapon has uh, an always on ability just from having it attuned and wearing it. You bear the weapon, right? Doesn't yeah. matter that you're actually holding it. And then it has a secondary property for when it's actually wielded, brandished, and used in combat. Yeah, yeah. I mean that alone. Just how is it activated? How do you attune to it? How do you activate the properties of it? Are there command words? Do you have to make certain gestures? Do you? communicate or, or somehow make contact with the spirit of the magic item 
or whatever uh, you know magical essence sustains it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, is it semi sentient? Is it not? Does it have a personality or anything? All of those are things that can uh, influence the type of magic items that you create. You, they can influence how your players react to them, and it's a way to take kind of boring, low-powered magic items and make them something special and different by just changing little things about them or how you activate them. Um, there's some tables in Chapter 7 of the DMG. It's right after sort of the description of all the item types and what they do and right before the section on how to roll for random treasure. It's a series of four tables that basically give you special features, uh, insights into uh, like maybe the history of the item, if it has any quirks or, or, or minor special powers. And it's just like really cool series of tables that you can use to vary things up and turn those weird little, <laughs> you know, first, uh, first magic items that you get on those first few adventures into something a bit more memorable than a plus one something that's going to get like forgotten about by the time you get to fifth level. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, why just give them a plus one sword? Yeah, why just you give know? them a plus one sword? Right? Especially, I, well, I mean, it doesn't really matter what <laughs> what the experience level is for a player, but if you got a group of people who've been playing for a while, yeah, like that first magic item, like, oh, I got the I got a plus one dagger. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I think that those are, uh, yeah, the, the <laughs> plus one dagger, the plus one sword, the the sort of the standard magic items that you hear about. Like, there's really it, 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 from a DM's perspective, it can be frustrating to sort of feel like I'm, you know, I'm trying to create this world, we're trying to get immersed in it, we're trying to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have this certain shared experience that we want, and for the players to kind of treat the things that they're meant to see as valuable and and a reward and a, and a connection to the world as a snooze fest. Yeah. You know, and, and like there's some give and take there. There's obviously, you know, if nobody can use a sword or everybody already has a magic sword, then maybe a plus one uh, isn't going to be that uh, big of a deal. But it's a, a, a way of, I don't know, you, you can do something different with it. Mm -hmm. You can connect those uh, low level minor weapons and armor, and or not, maybe not necessarily armor, but like plus one swords and, and minor rings and things like that mm -hmm. as being tied to certain. Uh, former cultures in your world, like, okay, you know, all of the plus one swords, or a great many of them, come from when there was a, you know, an imperial legionnaire base here, and their mage rights, you know, crafted a great many uh, ensorcelled uh, swords and armor and the like, and you can find a lot of them, but, you know, this was cheap mass-produced magic, yeah. and, uh, you know, a lot of times these weapons are, uh, you know, they're still sharp, they're still good, the, the magic in them is still there, but maybe on a one, <laughs> you know, maybe when you fumble with them, there's something that might go wrong with it. And uh, the weapon is, uh, it doesn't like explode in your face or anything like that. It doesn't mutate you, but maybe it has the, uh, you know, something where it's like the, the bonus inverses itself because mm -hmm. the magic's old and it's been damaged and, and you just notice something's kind of wrong with this sword now, you mm -hmm. know? And so it, in that sense, they're not cursed or anything. You can just put the sword down and not have to worry about it. but it's kind of a, almost, you'd almost treat them as disposable weapons, you know, if you found one. Mm -hmm. Just, I use this until the enchantment on it breaks, or... Well, see, I could also see, like, maybe it has an ongoing enchantment that doesn't go away, but like, yeah. uh, like the sword burst cantrip, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Where the magic kind of pops out really quick. Yeah, uh -huh. And maybe the next day it comes back. Yeah. And, but once you roll a, a one again... It sort of like bursts. It, it happens yeah. again, yeah. you know, and then until the next dawn. Uh -huh. So it's it's kind of a minor cursed item. But yeah. A, another thing I was thinking about, and I think that this comes from like, uh, if I remember correctly, your, um, your heartbreaker rules, but like imagine a plus one sword that also has like a daily ability. Yeah. That, yeah, you got a plus one sword and it's awesome. Until you use this ability, it does a thing. Yeah. And then the next dawn, it resets as a plus one sword. Yeah. And yeah. after you use the thing, you don't. It, it, maybe it's still magical, but it it's doesn't have that plus one ability. Yeah. Yeah. So it becomes a like, do I want plus one to hit and damage, or do I want, or do I need this ability right now? Yeah. And so you know, it's it gives you some variability, but it's still not like overwhelming. It's still just once a day. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and and a lot of times these sort of minor magic items are, are interesting ways to introduce uh, not full fledged magic item effects like granting of whole new powers and, and things like that, but maybe they are ways to interact with class abilities of the player character, right? So if I've got a, a magic sword that I found fairly early on, 
and I'm a fighter, maybe it, it modifies what I can do when I action surge. Maybe it modifies um, the benefit that I get from weapon style uh, or some or fighting style or something like that. If, if I'm a, a monk or something and using uh, one of these weapons, it you know maybe it, it does something or modifies or adds to one of my monk abilities that I can use. Or maybe it's magic in the sense that it confers the ability to be used on anyone that picks it up. So you can have weapons that are usable by people that otherwise aren't proficient in them. And it's just like, okay, I can use this now because the item confers its benefit on me just by mm -hmm. virtue of me wielding it. It's a weapon uh, <laughs> of usage. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, or, or it, it maybe it does something that, you know, that's not necessarily explicitly magical. It, it uh, you know, enhances the natural abilities of uh, the wielder, it, it, for instance, maybe it allows them to add double uh, their ability bonus uh, a couple of times per day to say damage or, uh, or to hit or something like that. And it's, it's less that this thing is magical and the magic of it enhances your own ability. Uh, and so those are some ways to kind of like have minor, particularly like magic weapons. Uh, it, co purely cosmetic stuff is also available. Like, does it leave a trail of something? As, you know, as it arcs through the air, smoke, lightning, fire, mm -hmm. uh, ghosts, uh, you know, something. Yeah. You know. <laughs> or something truly kind of uh, chilling would be like a, a blade of bleeding, where when yeah. it's drawn, it's always dripping. It blood. just like drips blood. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so maybe it's hard to do disarms against it or something. Oh, like sure, that. yeah, something like, like that. It gives you advantage when defending against being disarmed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ironically, yeah, <laughs> the handle never gets wet though you know <laughs> yeah and so it's like as you're thinking of these sort of minor things maybe you're using those tables in the dmg to like inspire you um you, you know you're now thinking like okay I've, I've got a solid outline for what this magic item should be it, you know if it's one that you are creating for an npc or something you just like put it in the game right but if you're putting it in there for uh, a player then you'll want to check out the rules for crafting items in xanathar's guide right mm -hmm. and they are fairly, you know, they're not extensive, they're, they're undoubtedly have holes in them and the like, but mm -hmm. if you're looking for something fast and useful, uh, I think they're, they're a good fit. They're basically just remind you that you need some sort of recipe or formula. And sometimes in the published adventures you'll find a recipe or a formula for magic items that, that's in the treasure, but um, especially now that I, I think uh, Artificer makes use of uh, these recipes as well. So it's, um, you want to find that, and it can be as, as abstract or as detailed as you like. Um, you'll need some sort of uh, exotic ingredients in addition to just the mundane ingredients that the item will have uh, or require. And it's sort of, I don't know, it kind of gives you some guidelines on what exotic ingredients would be. At the very least, it kind of tells you, hey, here's the CR range of creatures you might find who have the ingredients you need, yeah. <laughs> depending on the, the power level of the item uh, that you're creating. And yeah, you're uh, not going to make a plus four weapon out of <laughs> goblin teeth, right? Right. Unless it's a lot. <coughs> Unless it's a lot. A of goblin lot teeth. of goblin teeth. And so it just kind of like it's it's guidance. It's guidelines. It, it asks you to sort of like consider the monster that you might use that's reflective of this uh, item. This is also one of those things where just like a quick search on say DM's Guild or just Google will reveal all kinds of people who poured through the monster manuals and been like, these are the kinds of things you can find on monsters. But mm -hmm. you know, it, it's fairly easy to kind of come up with, you know, what does the item do? Is the item based around fire? Then you might need the ashes of a fire elemental or the scales of a salamander or something like that. And then finally it reminds you that the point of the of creating these things is not an exercise in bookkeeping and accounting and the like. It's to have an adventure, to go out and find the monster that you need the ingredients of, to mm -hmm. craft the thing, which is part of downtime, and to then you know have this unique and special item that you created for yourself. In that sense, I think like the combination of the two, of like the dungeon master creating the item with the player's input and then like the character forging it is just, I don't know, I, I like that image. I like that look, it sounds fun. It seems like an interesting way to add these items to the game and make them like matter more than just like, oh, this is what I rolled randomly on the table. When, mm -hmm. It's what you find when you open the dusty chest in the old tomb, yeah, <laughs> as yeah. it were. <laughs> oh no, m m most definitely. When it comes to, to magic items, um, one of our favorite games. Yeah. 
and we I think we kind of touched on this earlier, but I'd like to I'd like to talk about a different way to look at items like doing like single use items like a oh, yeah. cipher like yeah, exactly, ciphers yeah. like. Mm -hmm. It's something like, I mean, there are potions, it's kind of what that is, but like other items, like why can't you find a pendant that sure. just has one, you know, whatever in it? Yeah. It's, that's it, you know, yeah. it, you don't need to attune to it or anything. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just you figure out what it is, you know the word, and it does a thing. It does a thing, yeah. I like them. I mean, I like them in Numenera, I like them in, in, in Cypher. I find that single use effects, particularly like scrolls and potions, tend to get forgotten about yeah. in D&D. &D. Um, and I, I'm not, I've, I've always sort of like, worried about that I guess you know it's like oh why, don't, why aren't they being used more am I handing these out as treasure and nobody cares or you know they only use you know potions when they're potions of healing and I think it's probably you know a combination of uh, out of sight out of mind and uh, or you know you have a lot of other things to choose from or it could also be like I only have two of them like I, I, I gotta save them what am I gonna do and Cypher system solves this by the assumption that you are going to get ciphers out of your ass. You know, just like everywhere. They're yeah. a part of almost every enemy you might fight. You can just go searching for them. Some classes can just like, generate them. <laughs> you know, like they're just tinkering. And, oh, I've got a cipher. Because they keep the form and function of ciphers separate. Mm -hmm. Right, you don't. They're not always. You know, this is this thing, and this is what it does. It's just here are some effects. Here are some forms it might take. So the DM's free to like think of all the different ways that they might be able to harvest or introduce these single-use items. And so in the spirit of that, I, I think that you can look at things like spell scrolls and potions and the like in your game, and you don't necessarily have to go like, it's in a bottle, it's magic liquid in a bottle, or it's magic writing on magic paper. It could be, you know, other kinds of alchemical items, powders, pastes, creams, uh, aerosols, uh, <laughs> injections, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, 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 they could be symbiotic organisms that have lifespans measured in minutes that, uh, you know, that you put inside you. They could be uh, temporary spells that you learn regardless of your ability to cast spells. Uh, they could be magical tattoos that get activated. Uh, or, you know, once you, you know, you're ready to gain the benefit. Um, of course, you can do scrolls, spell gems. Uh, it might be blessings of the gods. You know, it could be that the, the reward you get is, you know, you can cast, uh, you know, cure wounds three times or something. Um, although those those kind of benefits are also in the uh, the DMG. Try considering magic food and drink, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, we've got a, a video where we sort of talk about how you might... Uh, make those magic foods for yourself, but it could be that you're rewarded with, uh, you know, something like a Limbus bread or, you know, even better. Um, and then it could also be like, <laughs> I was just sort of thinking all the different ways you could uh, justify kind of like, I've got this bonus now that I didn't have earlier and it's, you know, maybe they're temporal blessings where it's like when you need it most, it this, spell, this spell will be upon you. Mm -hmm. And that's just, uh, you know, a fancy way to say when the player's ready, you'll have this <laughs> benefit. <laughs> it could be something as simple as just like die re-rolls or, uh, you know, a certain number of times you can invoke an advan advantage. All different things that offer minor, well, minor benefits uh, and the like, but you don't have to worry about, you know, oh God, what I'm going to have this thing in the game permanently. Um, you can have uh, you know, more powerful effects actually be uh, single use and you know who cares right mm -hmm. Just do it once and it's gone i always find that people are always crafting magic swords magic armor uh, we're making boots yeah and it's yeah, just yeah like you know make the make the small stuff you know you could make a small stuff right like, yeah make a magic oil that you put on the sword that that does what you need it to and, and in some ways like that's what the artificer is right the right. artificer is the 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 one who's creating minor magic items to you know for for single use but i don't think they have to be the only one that does it and and certainly you can hand out treasure and the like um you know without the need for an artificer to be around oh yeah oh, 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 <laughs> definitely what are some of your uh favorite items that you've that you've crafted for your either players or your pcs uh -huh. I used to do a lot more of this kind of item creation mm -hmm. uh, whenever I was uh, a younger DM, and I'd sort of go through and it's like, all right, you know, these are the magic items that are part of this kingdom, right? They're sort of the crown jewels of it, and, and it was fun for me to kind of go through all of the major NPCs or major organizations and outline and create uh, custom items uh, for them. And a lot of those I'd take from like other game systems and, and sort of like figure out, oh, how can I, uh, you know, create this magic item that's in, say, Warhammer Fantasy Battle in D&D? &D? How do I translate that? 
Uh, so that's sort of where I got started really making a lot of custom items for my campaign. And, and they would be just like page after page after page of items I never really intended for the players to get a hold of. A lot of them were way too powerful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they'd be like plus seven thundering, flaming, you know, kind of uh, uh, weapons. But nowadays I find that I do a lot of reskinning and, and take just a... Uh, a magic item from the DNG or something and describe it differently. And um, that's worked really well for Land Between Two Rivers because the magic items that I've been able to pass out there are everything from like a cyborg laser eye, which is a circular blasting, to various kinds of other magical tech that, that works to different degrees. Uh, and then items like an assassin's dagger that causes the victim to feel no pain mm -hmm. when they're struck with it so that they don't know that they've just been stabbed, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they, uh, and, you know, by two feet of poison steel or yeah. <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> this is my mosquito's blade. Right. Um, uh, you know, it, currently I'm, I'm working on items that are bio-magical uh, in nature. So I'm really allowing myself to be inspired by, say, the Tyranids in 40K and other sorts of, like, biomechanical uh, uh, hybrid-type uh, things because... There's a lot of biomancers in, in Land Between Two Rivers, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, remnants and, uh, you know, parts of their legacy that are used by everyday people because it's like, yeah, this thing might be a living creature, but it's also a convenient weapon. You know, it's like it's easy to hold, and it kind of looks like a spear. Mm -hmm. It's like a spear fish that I could just use on my own, you know, something like that. Or it's a weird acid spewing insect that just happens to be fine with living on my arm, you know, or, or something that, that's a, you know, that highlights the weird, bizarre, just mutant nature of, of the magic of vivamancy. But I think maybe the lung eel might be the one that I've gotten the best reaction out of. You know, the party, some party, most of the party members could breathe underwater, one of them couldn't. And in lieu of taking a, a potion of water breathing, it's like you're gonna swallow this eel and it's gonna live in your lungs for a while. And you know, within a week, uh, drink this, snort this poison powder and that'll force it out of your lungs because otherwise it'll start chewing its way out or lay eggs in there or you don't want it in there for that long. You just want to be able to breathe for a couple hours, uh, <laughs> you know. But there are a lot of things like that where I, I want items that are grotesque. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I want items that reflect the setting, and I want items that have a bit of cost to them. Like, you, you can use this, but you, you're not going to be unchanged by it, mm -hmm. you know, even if temporarily. You know. For Star Wars Bound, uh, most of the items I made, like, uh, of course, I made I, I made laser pistols. Oh, certainly, right. Um, I mean, it's, it's literally just like basically a wand of magic missiles that you have to use your attack bonus. The, the, you know, it's literally, there's a hammer that you cock back and a, and a trigger <laughs> and axe it because the whole deal was they wanted to make wands for pirates that yeah. they didn't need any kind of magic or don't oh, even certainly. need a word. You just and be able to you, pick this up. And, and they could be used in the Flogiston. Could be used right. in the Flogiston because uh -huh. that was the big thing is you need weapons that are out there. So it's force damage. Yeah. But, uh, but the bad thing, of course, is if you roll a one on your D20, well, you roll a D20 again. Uh-huh. And it's basically confirming a crit fail. Gotcha. And if you roll another one, then it explodes. Mm. Uh, and the whole deal is, is the pistols have 10 charges, and then it regains 1d6 charges per day. Yeah. And so it kind of has to recharge, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. And so there is a limit to it per day. But the thing is, is each charge is a d10, and however many charges are in it when it explodes, that's what you take. Ooh. So if you are firing for the first time that day, you take 10d10. And, you know, I, I made sure to tell, like, Elry was the one, and of course it was Greg, that was like, I want a fucking laser pistol. I'm like, all right, just remember, when this, if this happens, this is what's going to happen. And he's yes. like, well, at least I have, you know, my, <laughs> I, have my I have my thief's ability to reduce damage by half. <laughs> he's like, I'll make sure to always have that. Yeah. Um, but, so, you know, I, I, I had those because, I, you know, I wanted something nice and easy. And then later on, I, I made basically what would be, I don't know if it would be a legendary item or an artifact. Um, yeah. But it was the helm of the guardian of the of the eighty fourth outer gate uh, that that Dekul eventually tried to put on. Yeah, and it was just a couple of charisma saves you have to pass to gain control of it because it is a semi sentient item because yeah. it's basically the portal is a living thing. Right, it's right, a living right. fire elemental that is allowing itself to be the transitory doorway between two planes. Yeah, and so you are basically wearing the helmet that controls it. So you have to 
barter with it. Certainly. And all it really wants is to be used. And so that's what I was kept impressing was like, just use the power, just use it. Yeah, yeah. And and he and and Dekul was like freaked out by that. <laughs> And he couldn't pass that second save, but he, the thing is, is there's a threshold for failure, and he was literally failing by like one. Uh, and so it's not like the item can try, start to try to take him over, because it was right. like, well, if you, it's, I had it where if you fail by three or more, sure, um, that the item can start to try to influence you. Yeah, yeah. And so he literally failed twice <laughs> by on one, <laughs> and it was like right at the edge. And I was like, it's one of those moments as a DM. He's like, all right, no, I'm gonna try to take this off. And they used a wish to take the helmet off. Oh yeah. And I was just, I was like, literally like, you're like one pass save away from basically having a ring of fire elemental control yeah. and uh, plane shift once a day to the fire plane because you can literally shift to there, your yeah. gate uh -huh. from wherever you are once a day. <laughs> uh, and there was a couple of other things, but it was mostly like, it was really powerful in the plane of fire. Yeah. And But other than that, you know, you still like get fire resistance. You know, uh -huh. there's a lot of benefits and as a DM, you have to, you He's can't, still, yeah, you can't just go, just keep trying. Yeah, you, you know, and, and he took the wish to take the helmet off and then they bartered away at a, a whorehouse in hell. Yeah. And it, and like, you're just sitting there watching a legendary item get traded off for information. Uh, yeah. But you never, I mean, you can't, you, you can't. Just, I, yeah. It, it, it's, it, and I think like, that's the, that's a fun story, right? Yeah. Like that is, that's the story of a powerful item that got lost. You know, like it. Yeah, we don't know what happened to it. You know, and and mm -hmm. it's you know it ends up somewhere and and could be all kinds of uh, inadvertent shenanigans by letting a legendary item like that just disappear. Oh well, especially and, you know, who's going to find it? Yeah, well, especially when it's the it's the literal back door into a very powerful ally of the players, and they've made a lot of powerful enemies. Yeah. So you better believe that that helmet's going to pop back up. Yeah. And it ain't going to be pretty when it does. It's not going to be pretty. It's certainly not. <laughs> Uh, but that's the that's the way that you know you can have custom items sort of like drive the story of your game yeah. and, and and sort of like really move events forward in in, uh, yeah. in game. It's fun. It uh, yeah. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast show audio discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. WebDM is a proud partner of D&D Beyond, our favorite supplement for our D&D games. We've got a link to them in the description. Go and check them out. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week, and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. The use of the tables in chapter seven to introduce backstory, unusual construction, uh, history, and minor properties. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they have guidelines on, um, so sort of like back to the chapter nine in the DMG, yeah. has guidelines for really like actually creating a new item. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So they got like, it, they're basically talking about, you know, is this a does this grant the character a new ability or does it enhance an, an existing one? Of trying to determine like the, that, those are kind of the two criteria that they mention. Mm -hmm. uh, and anything that doesn't do one of those things, they're sort of like, eh, maybe it's not really a, a magic item. But they also have a, a bit of guidelines on just like gauging what it is that the item can do, as well as a chart that breaks down. Like, what's the maximum spell level that's appropriate for uncommon items? Oh yeah, or, yeah by rarity and all yeah, that. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and and so that's, those are um, interesting guidelines to read before you start creating these new items, uh, mm -hmm. as well as sort of like the two criteria that they use for attunement. Mm -hmm. And it's basically like, can this item be passed around between multiple people and oh, they yeah. all gain the benefit of it? Yeah. <laughs> then no, it requires please. attunement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and is it like, it, if you would want, if you ever acquired like multiples of the same item, mm -hmm. would the benefits like stack or something? In that case, they require attunement. And yeah, like ring it. of protection or, right. or cloak of protection. Something like yeah, that, yeah. yeah. So like it, mostly though, that chapter nine and then those tables in chapter seven uh, in the DMG, they're, they're guidelines and you'd want to like, you know, they're good places to start with creating your item, but really I think the best inspiration for it is just like, what do you need for your campaign? What do you want mm -hmm. to, for the party to have access to? Uh, and then you can, you know, I don't know, go and have fun making those items. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Use something that already exists, extrapolate to what you want. Oh yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. has fun. Yeah.